Very few institutions in our modern society are as personal or as powerful as the family. Its politics are fraught with intense emotion and dogmatic devotion. It is the favored battleground of the right, who frame themselves as its valiant defenders against the vicious hordes of social progress. And yet it is often near and dear to the hearts of even the most committed radicals, who may critique its configuration, but nonetheless desire its amelioration, not its discontinuation. Cis-heteropatriarchy, the system of power based on the supremacy and dominance of cishet men, and gerontocracy, the system of power based on the supremacy and dominance of adults, may be condemned by some, but almost universally, the family is still held in high esteem. Almost universally. While the family has been seen as sacred by many, even by some anarchists like Proudhon, the OG Emma Goldman was very vocal in her critiques, and even Marx and Luigi called for the abolition of the family. But before we get carried away, let's actually define our terms. It may surprise you to learn that the definition of the family is actually not cut and dry. These days, there's a vague identification of the family with close personal relations, by blood and or affinity. But early Western anthropologists and sociologists once considered the family as they understood it to be a natural universal. Later research uncovered that many societies have viewed family differently, more broadly through ideas of living together and sharing food, care, and nurture. That is, if they even have a concept of family. You see, if we make the concept of the family infinitely elastic, to encompass every kinship arrangement across every human society, then we would essentially be trying to cram our own cultural biases and ideas onto a spectrum of distinct and unique cultures. However, for the sake of this video, we'll adopt a broad banner. There are so many arrangements currently held under the banner of the family. So many sizes, kinship terminologies, linealities, localities, and forms of residence. But although the family is seen as natural, it is not. It is political, and it is social. The category of the natural has been used to defend so much of our contemporary arrangements. Human nature, natural justice, natural hierarchy, natural male supremacy, the eternal nature of the free market, and in this case, the natural family. Just to be clear, biological reproduction is natural, but the family as we understand it today is not. Just as eating is natural, but grocery stores are not. From race to class to nationality, appeals to nature have been used to justify and legitimize social inequality and social division. Always scrutinize appeals to nature. But aren't women naturally dependent on men for protection and support due to pregnancy? No. While pregnancy, childbirth, lactation and childcare are physically and mentally demanding, it does not necessarily follow that women's dependence is inevitable. Aren't children naturally dependent on total parental rule? No. While children are still developing physically and mentally, it does not follow that gerontocracy is necessary for their development. Gender and age egalitarian societies still exist around the world today, particularly among immediate return gatherer hunter groups. If, for example, freedom of movement and association was guaranteed, contraception was readily available, the responsibility of childcare was shared equally among all genders within a community, and the subjugation and indoctrination of children in service of capital was not the dominant model. The material conditions for women's dependence on men and children's domination by adults would not exist. We cannot blame biology for us not living in such a society. We must look to politics. Today we'll be exploring the forgotten importance of alloparents, the ideology of the nuclear family, and the ways we can challenge and rethink the family. For the hundreds of thousands of years of our existence, even before we were anatomically modern, humans have been what's known as cooperative breeders. Human infants have developed the ability to engage many adults into caring for them, and human mothers have relied on the extensive shared support and care of their offspring by alloparents. 
aka other members of their social groups. That is how we've been so successful as a species. And we're not alone. Wolves, elephants, lions, corvids, and mice have all been quite successful at leaving Africa and spreading across the globe thanks to cooperative breeding. In Sarah Blafferhurdy's Mothers and Others, she argues that the interplay between infants' commitment to enlist caretakers and adults' willingness to serve as caretakers is the evolutionary basis of the human ability for mind reading, and in turn, our vast capacity for cooperation. Without cooperative breeding, our species likely would not have even evolved, as resource sharing is essential to survival when raising slow-maturing, relatively large, and very dependent young. There's a lot of propaganda about our past that posits that we lived in a dog-eat-dog world of hyper-competition. But while competition did play a role in our development, cooperation, especially in child-rearing, has been far more crucial for the development of our humanity. Cooperative breeding provided the evolutionary foundation for bigger brains, longer lifespans, and language by making the extended childhood and high caloric requirements of humans possible to maintain. Our fellow human neighbors better served as sharing partners, not competitors, in most cases. Anthropologists used to think traits like tool making, walking on two legs, hunting cooperatively, and engaging in group-based violent conflict were what separates humans from other great apes. But we've found these activities in other species. So what distinguishes human beings from other great apes is our extremely pro-social capacity for identification, altruism, compassion, cooperation, gift-giving, mind-reading, mutual understanding, goodwill, and caring, which support our ability to participate with others in collaborative activities with shared goals and intentions. And the origins of those traits lie in how we raised our young. An infant's allo parents were often maternal grandmothers, aunts, fathers, the mother's lovers, siblings, cousins, uncles, grandfathers, and other unrelated kin, and their support was crucial. Maternal grandmothers in particular play a vital role in the well-being of their grandkids. Miss you, Granny. The key to maximizing human-child survival has been flexibility, where allo parents can step in to pick up the slack and mothers can move freely to wherever they can get the most support. To quote Herdy, flexibility was, and continues to be, the hallmark of the human family. Unfortunately, it seems we've lost a great extent of this flexible nurturing arrangement in our modern industrial capitalist world. The invention, accumulation, and hoarding of private property has shifted emphasis upon competition, and the consequences have been rather dire. Sure, there are neighborhoods and households and cultures where elements of cooperative breeding are still present, but the atomization of our present capitalist system has quite thoroughly kept us from reaching the full potential of our cooperative nature. Today, the dominant model places the burden of childcare squarely on the shoulders of the parents, who are stretched thin and run ragged by demands they are not equipped to handle alone. We now observe that children raised without extensive social contact display disorganized attachment, poor empathy, and poor cooperative skills. And when they grow up, the cycle repeats itself, entrenching us deeper into this asocial order. We can actually trace part of the shift away from cooperative breeding towards these more isolated arrangements, much further back than just the rise of private property and capitalism in the past few centuries. In fact, it was the emergence of patriarchy that would set the stage for many of the systems of domination we see today. The creation of patriarchy was not a single event, but rather a process that took place in different parts of the world over different periods of time. It is not innate to human existence. The view that women were designed by God to be property, the childbearing and rearing, physically weaker and submissive gender, the view that children exist as the property of their father, and the view that the mere existence of queer people is a threat are ideological positions. Misogyny, gerontocracy, and queerphobia are not biological or psychological. They are social and political. In the creation of patriarchy, 
Gerda Lerner argues it is likely that gender-segregated tasks were accepted long before the entrenchment of gender-based oppression. In gatherer-hunter societies, women usually gather and men usually hunt, but these tasks are not strictly segregated to any particular gender. Strict gender rules would only be reinforced later on, as some societies shifted to patrilineality and patrilocality, where kinship is traced through the male line and male power is reinforced thanks to the father's nearby kin, leading to an erosion of women's collective power. Notice I said some societies. A few never developed patriarchy, and others had patriarchal arrangements introduced through colonization. Myths of Male Dominance by Eleanor Burke Leacock is a great resource for learning more about that. The simple arrangement of daily tasks would harden into the formation of gender rules, and the preference of child-rearing became the only allowable option as laws were put in place to institutionalize the patriarchal family model and minimize women's presence in the collective historical memory. The Hammurabi Code is one famous example of controlling women, but efforts to remove women from the divine, as seen in the Abrahamic religions, efforts to establish rigid gender identities, efforts to co-opt female fertility symbols, and the Aristotelian cultural myth that women are spiritually or mentally incomplete, can also be seen as stages in patriarchy's development and entrenchment. Centuries of social allocation, cultural adoption, and legal reinforcement created the patriarchal structure we live under today, and it is maintained with those same mechanisms by people of all genders. As Luna argues, women have historically played a large role in the systemic subjugation of women, whether for self-preservation, to receive the benefits of class and more modernly race, or for other reasons. The prototype of the state, as the Kurdish Mario Abdullah Ocalan points out in Liberating Life, is the patriarchal family. In fact, he goes so far as to describe the family in this social context as man's small state. The patriarchal family, as an institution, is so powerful because it works so well to reinforce state power. Power is invested in the male head, women's unlimited and unpaid labor is secured, children are raised to supply the population, the example of women's servitude serves as a foundation and justification for other forms of slavery and oppression, and the oppressive ideology is reproduced in the next generation. That is why it is so sanctified. The elite need the patriarchal family and the labor it freely provides in order to maintain their stranglehold on the world. The structural power of the state can only exist as long as there are similar structures of power that mimic its values, proliferating through other social relations. Some people don't even mind if a boot is on their neck, as long as they get to put a boot on other people's necks. But then we must ask, why did some human groups develop patriarchy while others did not? After all, there have been all sorts of human arrangements, and egalitarianism hasn't been restricted to nomadic hunter-gatherers alone. We now know of a few egalitarian cities where decision-making power is spread equally. Agriculture did not necessitate hierarchy in human groups, though it does make it easier for some new hierarchies to develop, and patriarchy is not inevitable. However, patriarchy is often quite convenient in certain material conditions. Nation hierarchies can become more complex, more authoritarian, and more violent under particular circumstances. The societies that have managed to stave off the development of patriarchy have been those who specifically organized to prevent it. Gender is one potential axis of conflict in human society, which is why overcoming such conflict must be a constant activity. I'll explain how later in the video. Unfortunately, today we live in a world dominated by the state, by capitalism, and by patriarchy. Thousands of years after the patriarchy developed around the globe, the emergence of industrial capitalism would bring about the meteoric rise of the nuclear family, which is exactly what we're going to examine next. The institution of the nuclear family is a recent phenomenon, as in, it only gained massive prominence in the complex industrial commercial societies we live in today, yet people treat it like this eternal standard of human social arrangement. The nuclear family is an independent, conjugal unit 
consisting of a husband, typically the primary breadwinner, wife, typically the primary caregiver, and children, with a neolocal residence pattern, meaning husband and wife live apart from both of their parents. And the nuclear family is indeed pretty much on its own, or at least it's expected to be. The nuclear family should be understood in two senses. Firstly, it is a social and economic institution. Secondly, it is a powerful ideology. It is seen as inevitable, as naturally given, and as biologically determined. It is imbued with a unique social and moral force, and it is seen as the embodiment of general human values, rather than the conventions of a particular society. The stereotypical nuclear family, despite not being the most common arrangement in much of the world, is still the most popular in the minds of the public. But how did this come to be? Let's take a moment to map the meteoric rise of the nuclear family. British historians Alan McFarlane and Peter Laslett found that the nuclear family was actually, uniquely, the primary arrangement in England since the 13th century, unlike the multi-generational households of Southern Europe and Asia. The flexible, young nuclear family was ever mobile as they searched for opportunity and property. By the 17th century, the nuclear family began gaining prominence in Western Europe and New England, and with the emergence of proto-industrialization and early capitalism, the nuclear family was starting to become a financially viable social unit. However, the more common social unit in early American history was the corporate family, or co-provider family, not, as is commonly believed, the multi-generational extended family which wasn't particularly common as life expectancy was quite low and the settler population was relatively young. In the corporate family household, whether farm or non-farm, labor was central. It was a place of production, so all members were expected to provide their labor to sustain the family. These households were usually large because of high birth rates and the common practice of taking in assorted relatives and non-related people, like boarders, hired hands, servants, other people's children, orphans, the ill, and of course, slaves. In 1800, 90% of American families were corporate families. During this time, colonizers worked overtime to separate native families, settling their children in residential schools across the country, while slave owners worked tirelessly to break apart African families, making the black family structurally impossible to maintain. Attempts to practice traditional kinship arrangements or forge new meanings of community had to confront the precariousness, lack of autonomy, suppression of agency, and gratuitous violence determined by the structures of white supremacy and colonialism. The fragmentation and destruction of families remains one of the key strategies of imperialists the world over. And it's obvious why. Extended families are resilient, far more resilient than a nuclear family. One or more families can serve as a complex, supportive web of relationships that can absorb the shocks of life. As Britain and the US began to change rapidly thanks to industrialization and a growth in life expectancy, the extended family served as a haven for some. Between 1750 and 1900, the prevalence of extended families living together roughly doubled, becoming more prevalent than at any time before or since. Of course, extended families aren't perfect. They may be more stable, but they're often also quite exhausting, quite stifling, and quite traditional in the worst senses of the word. Patriarchy, of course, abounds, even in extended families where grandmothers are at the supposed head. There's very little privacy and even less mobility. Family bonds may be stronger, but individuality is difficult to maintain. So as industrialization progressed and factories began to open in major U.S. cities during the late 19th and early 20th centuries, young folks left their extended families and corporate families to start their own nuclear families, affording them more mobility and adaptability. By the 1920s, the nuclear family with a male breadwinner had replaced the corporate family as the dominant family form and reigned supreme from 1920 to 1960. And it wasn't long before the cult of the nuclear family began to form in the U.S. In a 1957 survey, 80% of the respondents said that unmarried people 
was sick, immoral, or neurotic. It was assumed that healthy people lived in heterosexual, two-parent families. By 1960, 77.5% of all children were living with their two parents who were married and apart from their extended family. The all-American ideal of mom, dad, and 2.5 kids with spot the dog in some white and white picket fence suburb was here. And for a while, the arrangement seemed to be working. I put working in air quotes for obvious reasons. After all the stable, white, nuclear family society that people put so much stock in today only truly worked from about 1950 to 1965. And only because women were entirely relegated to the household, nuclear families were themselves deeply intertwined with other nuclear families, and every economic and sociological condition in society worked to support the otherwise fragile institution. Thanks in part to the whites-only prosperity of the post-war GI Bill, high church attendance, high unionization, and high social trust, family cohesion was easy to maintain. White men were making nearly 400% more than what their dads were making at the same age. Married women, on the other hand, were barred from employment and had to spend hours upon hours trapped inside the home under patriarchal rule, raising kids. It was enough for many to go a little mad. But still, they did have a bit of support. Coalitions of nuclear families in a state of mutual interdependence were fairly common. People were part of one another's lives. They lived on each other's front porches, helped raise one another's children, constantly bartered household goods, grilled together, played sports together, and walked into each other's homes without knocking like it was a set of some cheesy family sitcom. There was, and still is, a lot to appreciate about the nuclear family, though, despite the flaws I can't help but keep bringing up. We can't choose our families, but there's a strange comfort to be found in that fact. Abusive and toxic households notwithstanding, and trust me, I'll get to those later. The nuclear family home is still a refuge for many. A place where, when you have to go there, they have to take you in. Home has a level of security, obligation, familiarity, dependency, and vulnerability that you often really can't find anywhere else. The appeal of the nuclear family is also heightened by its uniquely child-centered nature. Since nuclear families tend to have far less children, each child is afforded more focused attention under a parenting style that can be described as concerted cultivation. And in turn, the belief that children need two parents, lest they be an object of pity, also facilitates its appeal. And then there's the related anxiety, which fuels homophobia, that a child lacking a same-sex parent with whom to relate to cannot be properly developed. Of course, this anxiety is unfounded, as children from same-sex pairings are just as psychologically healthy, capable, and successful as those raised by opposite-sex couples. But the anxiety persists. And of course, all of this assumes a healthy marriage and a healthy household, because the appeal of marriage and the nuclear family lies not in the reality per se, but in the opportunity for warmth and interdependency. The reality kind of sucks a lot of the time. But bliss or hell, the 1950 to 1965 period was not normal. And what happened after explains the steady decline of the nuclear family and why I don't see it making a significant comeback. The situation of the family in post-Fordist capitalism is contradictory in precisely the way that traditional Marxism expected. Capitalism requires the family as an essential means of reproducing and caring for labor as a solve for the psychic wounds inflicted by chaotic social economic conditions, even as it undermines it. Denying parents time with children, putting intolerable stress on couples as they become the exclusive source of effective consolation for each other. A combination of factors, good and bad, ended the domination of the sheltered, male breadwinner nuclear family of the 50s in the US. With the rising feminist movement came the freedom for women to live and work as they chose, leading to dual earner nuclear families dominating in the mid-20th century. Individual fulfillment, privacy and autonomy as ideals gained more prominence. People began to expect more from marriages than just child rearing, and wages declined significantly. The general American birth rate has declined. People have married later, if at all, 
More people have been living with old romantic partner than ever before, and families have shrunk in size and shattered left and right as divorce rates peaked in 1981. Families have also grown more unequal in America over the past two generations. Affluent people don't only marry more and stay married, but they also have the resources to buy the support that the extended family and community used to provide in the form of babysitting, professional childcare, tutoring, coaching, therapy, expensive after-school programs, and life coaches. Meanwhile, working-class families struggle financially, emotionally, and mentally to build and maintain stability. And what about black folks? Black historian W.E.B. Du Bois recognized over a century ago that black women formed the essential core of the black family. And he also recognized that the structure of white supremacy was dead set under the destruction of the strength and pride of African notions of matriarchy, family, and community. The sociocultural enforcement of the nuclear family model worked to erode the molds that Africans had long thrived on and carried out in their tradition, weakening and dismantling cooperative models of communal living, community fostering, space sharing, fictive kinship, social fathering, and strength in the face of oppression. From Rosewood to Seneca Village. When the LBJ administration put out the infamous patronizing Moynihan Report, describing the Negro community as retarded by a matriarchal structure that weakened the ability of black men to function as authority figures, it enforced the perception of non-nuclear family models as deviant criminalized black womanhood as emasculating and abusive, and sought to rally black men for the task of establishing patriarchal power over black women. This isn't to say that the nuclear family hasn't been or isn't being practiced by black folks, but it wasn't the tradition of the cultures our ancestors were stripped of. And despite white insistence that we be saved from ourselves via assimilation, black communities should strive not for hotep historical conceptions of black patriarchy, but for the autonomy to construct our own social arrangements. More on that later. Why isn't the picturesque 1950s nuclear family working for everyone? Why wasn't it able to weather the changes of the past few decades? Well, we're going to need to dig a bit deeper into the reality of nuclear family life, starting with class dynamics. The family creates and recreates the social stratification that determines the trajectory of our lives. It gives us each our initial class position, whether working class or property-owning class. The vast majority of people remain in the same class as their parents, and social classes reproduce themselves from generation to generation. This isn't to say that there's no mobility, as some do manage to move up and down the ladder of income, and even class, but rates of upward mobility have been on a steady decline for decades. The conditions of working class families especially make it extremely difficult for their children to succeed while the inheritance of privilege that the children of the wealthy enjoy allows them to concentrate wealth even further, reinforcing and expanding levels of wealth inequality. The family serves to pass on privilege and disadvantage from one generation to the next. And what about the condition of women in the family? When Anne Oakley explored the sociology of housework in the 1960s, an era where housework wasn't considered real work, she found that housewives worked an average of 77 hours per week. One woman worked for 48 hours per week, on top of her full-time job, and another worked a whopping 105 hours per week. And the work sucks. It's monotonous, repetitive, fragmented, long, and in some cases contradictory. Keeping a house clean and caring for children does be like oil and water. The work is done in lonely isolation from other adults, and it's not often appreciated and almost always unpaid. If the cash value of women's contributions was actually calculated, it would far exceed what their husbands could afford to pay. And worse yet, though things have progressed ever so slightly since the 60s, it doesn't even seem like women can escape care work. Whether they're married or not, whether they have a paid job or not, whether they have children or not, they seem bound to this oppressive vocation. Why? Because apparently keeping house is feminine. This burden placed on women means that they're stuck in this limbo where they can't enjoy life fully as they have an extra layer of oppression on top of the oppression we all face under capitalism. Motherhood is especially demanding 
entrapping, and suffocating. Unlike men, who can usually choose how and how much they get involved, the tasks are seen as inescapable for the women in the family. Not to say that men have it completely easy in the family either. The family is usually the place where toxic masculinity is imbued, by mothers, fathers, and extended family alike. And the consequences of toxic masculinity often haunt the mental and social health of men for the rest of their lives. Some men go on to perpetuate this oppressive arrangement when they start their own families, while unmarried men are often alienated from any kind of connection, healthy or not, which is why they tend to die far sooner. But loneliness under the reign of the nuclear family does not solely befall men. Particularly in the US, 35% of Americans over 45 are chronically lonely, and elder orphans are becoming all too common, with no close relatives or friends to care for them a trend that I speculate may rise in countries with aging populations. Marriage is not some harmless or neutral institution either. Don't get me wrong, marriage is appealing, and I intend to get married myself. It offers the promise of security, companionship, and love above all. But long-term partnership does not necessitate the institution of marriage. Marriage just happens to be sanctified and incentivized by church and state. It is a contract to bind two people together, controlled not by the partners themselves, but by those institutions. It is an institution privileged by social policy, taxation, religious endorsement, and the accolade of respectability. It is a tradition that carries with it the whole historical baggage of male power and patriarchal authority, even as it has been graciously extended to queer folks. It is seen as the pinnacle of human social bond, and relationships outside of it are viewed as less meaningful. It remains a deeply unequal social affair, particularly in the realm of household labor, despite the disappearance of the more formalized manifestations of paternal power. The privacy enjoyed in the nuclear family arrangement may be attractive when it works well and everyone's needs are satisfied, but privacy can also be a prison, a toxic domestic hell where folks of all genders and ages may be trapped by psychological, emotional, physical, and sexual abuse. Domestic abuse remains one of the most underreported violent crimes. Because freedom of association is limited by a lack of alternative housing, the family's prison has little chance of escape, and the experience of enclosure can be maddeningly total. While not unique to the nuclear family arrangement, the domination of children is especially pronounced under its form of gerontocracy. I've spoken extensively about the condition of children under gerontocracy on this channel and in my collab with Khadija Mbu, so I won't be as detailed here, but to summarize, the suppression of our agency and reduction of our personhood begins at home. Children are seen as the sole property of their parents, who are mostly free to reign over said property as they see fit. The family's role is to domesticate children in order to prepare them to maintain the status quo. And speaking of the status quo, because the nuclear family is bound up in a legacy of heteropatriarchy, consequentially, the suffering of queer folks is all too common. Queer youth who do not conform to the expectations of their traditional parents or society are at a high risk for physical, psychological, and sexual abuse, poor mental health, attempted suicide, homelessness, and drug abuse. Many are left with no escape. And as for queer adults, they're still often seen as a threat to the sanctity of marriage or of the children. Even in some progressive spaces, assimilation is the expectation. Queer folks are expected to convince the mainstream world that they are not a threat to the status quo in order to gain acceptance. Because the nuclear family is so privileged, people outside of it are disadvantaged. And because people outside of it are disadvantaged, the nuclear family is seen as the best option, even as it leaves the world bereft. To quote The Antisocial Family by Michelle Barre and Mary McIntosh, It is indeed a major agency for caring, but in monopolizing care, it has made it harder to undertake other forms of care. It is indeed a unit of sharing, but in demanding sharing within, it has made other relations tend to become more mercenary. It is indeed a place of intimacy, but in privileging the intimacy of close kin, 
It has made the outside world cold and friendless and made it harder to sustain relations of security and trust except with kin. Caring, sharing, and loving would be more widespread if the family did not claim them for its own. Take, for example, nurseries, children's homes, students' residences, nursing homes, and old people's homes. They're often seen as second best to normal family life. But they don't need to be. They can be stimulating spaces of cooperation, companionship, and variety. We just need to push past the overvaluation of the nuclear family that devalues all other arrangements. The nuclear family of the 1950s cannot be brought back. And it shouldn't be brought back. It's time to experiment with intimate social arrangements that can actually work for people. Feminists have been stereotyped as anti-family, but I think feminists recognize that the content of contemporary family life fails to realize its promise of intimacy, commitment, nurturance, collectivity, and individual autonomy. These are still valuable ideals, but they're impossible to realize under current conditions. We must find alternatives. The good news is that we can. As we've seen, humans are adaptable creatures and our family arrangements have evolved in response to different material conditions. We just need to be brave enough to let go of unworkable models and try something new, which in this case may in fact be a revitalization and reimagining of something very old. When we critique the family, we are confronting an agency for the reproduction of capitalist ideology, private property, class dynamics, patriarchy, etc. But we are also confronting an institution that most people, from the most privileged to the most marginalized, uncritically support. How can we maintain the integrity of our critique without alienating a whole lot of people? I believe the best way to do so is to break down the barriers between the critique of the family and support for the family. The problems with the family and the appeal of the family are closely related. We cannot approach discussion of the former without acknowledging the latter. And we cannot approach solutions to the former without those solutions accommodating the latter. If our long-term goal is for major social transformation to expand the basis of emotional, social, and material support beyond the family core, our actions in the present must prefigure those ends and demonstrate the potential of our aims. But you may be wondering, is it even possible to overcome and resist these powerful institutions and develop something better? Well, let's take a look at the Mbuti example. The Mbuti are an egalitarian, immediate return gatherer hunter society living in the Ituri forest of Central Africa. They're not all the same height, they don't all have the same skills, and they don't all do the same thing. They're egalitarian in the sense of equal distribution of decision-making power in a community, regardless of gender or age. They have a very lenient division of labor that often manifests as different functions of the same activity, with folks working together to care for children or collect food. Aside from their words for mother and father, they use non-gendered familiar labels and pronouns. And even when they form exclusive partnerships for rearing children, their marriages do not prohibit extramarital sex or love. As I mentioned in part one, the societies that have managed to stave off the development of patriarchy have been those who specifically organized to prevent it. So gender leveling rituals are practiced by the Mbuti to ease tensions and resist such developments. For example, they engage in a game of tug of war where when either side of the gender battle is winning, a member of the other side would switch genders in order to maintain the equilibrium. Gender fluidity has been observed in other cultures as well. The Mbuti stave off the development of gerontocracy through the symbiosis of their five recognized age groups. Infants, children, youths, adults, and elderly. Each age group has power and autonomy and an important role in maintaining a well-functioning society. The youth, for example, call out conflicts within the group usually caused by the adults, who provide the most sustenance, while the elderly reconcile conflicts as they arise. I don't point to the Mbuti or any other society 
in order to assert that we must copy them exactly. Obviously not. We live in different contexts, and the road we'll need to take to reach egalitarian ends will look different in many ways. But I introduced the example to indicate the possibility of gender and age egalitarianism in human society and to provide inspiration for potential radical alternatives. These solutions cannot exist in a vacuum. We cannot radically transform kinship as we know it today without transforming society as a whole. The alternatives I present here are not enough to usher in a complete revolution, but they are, to me at least, steps in the right direction. In combination with, and I cannot stress this enough, in combination with other preferative practices, like revolutionary students and workers' unions, they can expand the possibilities of choice available to people. Co-housing and collaborative community building would play an important role in the transformation I envision. We can modify existing architecture and build anew, whether for young parents, singles, childless couples, polycules, students, queer folks, the elderly, or a combination of all of them. Creating more integrated living with a balance of privacy and shared space can allow us to develop true community. These spaces, whether kitchens, workshops, gardens, parks, play areas, art studios, maker spaces, etc., can also allow for a more widespread distribution of care work. Take, for example, Temescal Commons in Oakland, California, where a group of working class families founded a consensus based co housing community based on the principles of radical hospitality, community, and sustainability. They began as a Christian community, but expanded to become interfaith, and they share a courtyard, laundry, workshop, and industrial-sized kitchen. They also share dinners twice a week and care for each other's kids. I think our community relationships should be modeled on a more robust and expansive form of friendship, where people choose how and how much they relate to one another, rather than slotting people into particular roles or hierarchies or obligations. We should also recognize that people have different proportions of different needs. Some people want a lot of togetherness and connection, while others may want a bit more solitude and privacy. Some people are in the middle of that spectrum, enjoying both common space and private space. People should be able to find what works for them. But how do we create these co-housing communities? Or how do we transform existing spaces to become more integrated? Temescal Commons shares less than half an acre in the middle of urban Oakland. So at least we know it is possible to create these spaces without moving out to some big rural commune. Honestly, I think it could start with conversations, at the very least. Get together with neighbors and get together with friends and find out what people are looking for and what people need. Start small with, you know, cookouts and see how you could build from there. If you're in an apartment, organize with your fellow tenants to increase your shared bargaining power and push your tenants union towards more radical aims up to and including rent strikes and taking the building for yourselves. The specificist practice of social insertion with the support of your affinity group can also definitely help. Your tenants union can build towards coordinating and confederating with a whole constellation of horizontally organized collectives, using a dual power strategy to both empower unions to fight landlords and also reclaim power over our lives and communities. It's gonna take a lot of work for dual power tenants unions to lay the foundation for autonomous popular associations. But they have an important role to play in the growth of organized counterpower to the rule of the landlords. It may also be possible for some to use crowdfunding measures to establish a community land trust and put their land and housing into their collective control. But for others, squatting may be a viable option. The squatting movement has a long and storied history. I'm not going to get into it here, but it's pretty interesting. And it is a very precarious living arrangement. But the lesson of said history is that in times of housing deprivation, people squat the empties. If people fight to occupy the many residential and non-residential buildings that stand empty and unused, they develop an understanding of their place in conflict with the state, an obstacle to our collective liberation. Housing aside, we can also explore a diversity of renewed alloparenting arrangements. Collective child rearing, as seen in Israel's kibbutzim, by the way, Free Palestine, 
allows kids to be exposed to a variety of opinions, lifestyles, and living spaces in their communities that would enhance their autonomy, cultivate their compassion, and help mitigate bad parenting. A formalized but non-religious form of godparenting can also lend care to kids every week and allow folks who don't have or want children to be a part of the investment in the next generation. Parents would, of course, be able to enjoy a much-needed break and better manage the many emotions that parenting elicits. Platonic parenting cooperatives are another option that allow single parents to share responsibilities and raise kids together. Whatever approach one chooses, it's clear that adult parenting is the best way for both children and parents to flourish. In What Kinship Is and Is Not by Marshall Salins, he argues that kinship relations are largely established in life by active participation in the existence of others, from sharing food, to sharing names, to sharing suffering. Considering the variety we observe in cultures around the world, it is clear that kinship formation is limited only by the human imagination. We can continue this tradition by forging new ties of kinship with a feeling of determined commitment as we transcend blood relations and the limitations of current conceptions of family. Better ways of living and relating are possible, and we can work together to create them. Peace. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, subscribe, and share with your fellow peoples. Thanks once again, of course, to the family, including our newest members, John Fletcher, Connor Everett, and Abigail Stevens. Join these beautiful humans and support me too on patreon.com slash true. Check out all my other videos for a range of radical topics. Follow me on Twitter at underscore Saint True. Thanks again. Peace. And now, a semi-ironic outro song on the nuclear family by Noah Sampson. No more family unit, only Antifa is in your house. Get rid of it. 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 Boom 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 That's just gone, that's just boom Oh is that new town? No, it's the family unit Monogamy is dead, go find hella partners Get rid of the family unit, yeah Get rid of it, get rid of it Get rid of it, 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 get rid